So if you'd open your Bibles um, to a couple of different places, but primarily we're going to be in uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And as hopefully we, we finish this uh, particular section up this morning, uh, I want to read our scriptures, but then what I'm going to do, and it might sound kind of um, off base, which would be pretty much indicative of my entire week. <laughs> Uh, so if it is, it is. I'm going to read a few verses out of the Psalms before we uh, then jump into these verses. So first, we're going to be in Romans 8, verses 28 through 30, and that will be the, the body of our study this morning. Scripture says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And what I had uh, asked you to do last week was kind of look through some of those words that uh, might be a little exciting. Um, the forenews and the predestined and the called and the all those other things. Believe it or not, those words through the years have uh, created havoc within the church. Uh, they've become uh, words that uh, different people uh, would, would literally take up and weaponize and use against um, uh, other members of the fellowship. And, and for me, I don't want to be one of those guys, so if I end up being one of those guys this morning, come up after service and say, hey, Sparky, you were one of those guys. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is try and give us a reasonable understanding, at least as far as uh, reasonable, as far as I'm concerned, of, of what the Lord uh, is doing through the pen of Paul um, as he brings these words <coughs> to uh, an infant church at Rome that's uh, under attack from all sides. And, and in doing that, I, I think we have to understand who the audience is. Now, now, Paul obviously is writing to the unsaved, right? <laughs> He's not. And sometimes we forget that Scripture is taken up by those who don't know the Lord, uh, those who perhaps have, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, answered a call at a concert, answered a call at the church, had answered a call in, in the midst of... Um, their, their horrendous times, maybe, and it was the wrong number. It wasn't, it wasn't the right, it wasn't uh, the call of Christ in their lives. It was simply an emotional response to an emotional moment, and so then they try and discern Scripture, and in discerning Scripture, what they end up doing is they just find everything wrong with it. But this is written to the church. This is written to the beloved. And this is written to those who have the Holy Spirit within them, those that have uh, the ability by the Holy Spirit illuminating Scripture for them, by the Holy Scripture being able to point to the death of Christ on the cross and the love of God for us before we loved Him. This is who it's written to. So I, I think we have to, to take it in that light. We have to embrace it in that light because there's a lot of things God says to His beloved. And if you're not focused on him and his glory and his goodness and his kindness and his provision, you're going to go, yeah, but what about them guys over there? It's, you got to let God worry about them guys over there. You, you can't take and, and take these scriptures and take them out of context. He's talking to us. He's talking to the redeemed. He's talking to the called. He's talking to the saved. He's talking to those that he had a relationship before we were even there. He knew. He foreknew. And, and so we have to we have to take and as we walk by faith and not by sight, we have to walk by faith sometimes through these scriptures because they're hard scriptures. They're hard things to get uh, get our brains around. And so what I want to do um, before I start our study this morning is I, I want to take us to a place that I think um, we need to go in order to understand um, the New Testament, maybe dwell for a moment in the Old Testament. There's a guy named King David. King David was a good king when he was a good king. King David was a 
terrible king. Well, it was a terrible king. <laughs> king David followed the Lord when he followed the Lord, and King David didn't follow the Lord when he didn't follow the Lord. But yet, God said he was what? A man after what? His own heart. And in the confession and the repentance and the restoration and God seeing the inner man, God absolutely knew what David was about. David was a sinner saved by faith. Saved through that grace that God poured out upon him. And, and not only in this particular song does David present his heart to God, David has a profound understanding of who God is, and, and I think we lack that today. We're so, we're so enamored by the things of the world, we're so distracted by the cares and, and, and the things going on that, that we don't have that deep understanding of how much we should take and rely upon our Lord and Savior. We just don't. And, and I'm not saying it's impossible, what I'm saying is, our cultural and social uh, surroundings don't really give us that leg up like David's did. I mean, there was truly enemies around every corner for King David. There were truly, I mean, he couldn't be distracted by channel, you know, a seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever you get on your TV and you're distracted by. No, he got distracted visually by things that he saw, and we, we do the same thing today, but, but what David knew was David knew his Lord and Savior. David understood his provision in God and his patheticness apart from God. And I think we need to understand that before we, we close up these last three verses in Romans. So I'm going to read out of uh, 139 Psalm, keep it brief, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to start out in... The first four verses are descriptive. The last two verses, uh, verses four and six, are, are reflective. O oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Verse five, you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. God is omniscient. Do you know what that means? He knows everything. So as we get into these verses later on, it's like, well, that's not fair. God knew that he would be saved. Well, what is he going to do? Like take a chunk off part of his brain or his being or his attributes and well, I can't know that part, but I can know that part. I can't see there, but I can see here. I can do this, but I can't. And that isn't God. So we, we have to be comfortable with the fact that, that for us, the called in Christ, the redeemed, those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, through the goodness and the grace of God the Father, who first loved us before we loved him, we, we, we have to be okay with him knowing everything. We have to be okay with him knowing all the nooks and the crannies and departments and, and the entirety of who we are before we were and through eternity that is yet to come. We have to be good with that. Continuing in verses uh, 7 through 12, we're told that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present, everywhere present all the time. Verses 7 through 12, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light for both along with you. In our moments of deep despair, God is there. In our moments where we exalt and praise his name, God is there. There is no place we can go and get out of the presence of God. And that's important to know because as, as we enter these times where it just seems like um, diseases are what? They're, they're expanding exponentially. His sickness is 
you know, they have a cure one moment, the next moment, oh man, that was a bummer, that really wasn't a cure, that just kind of helped, you know, just everything's changing. The situations in, in our lives, with family, with friends, uh, emotions, finances, just everything seems to be going at, at an incredible rate, yet for those of us who are his, God is omnipresent, never leaving, never forsaking, never going, hey, I wonder where Mark is. I know where Mark is, I don't have to ask that question. And the awesome part is that not only does he not have to ask that question about Mark, but he doesn't have to ask that question about what? 800 billion or 8 billion plus people that are waddling around the earth. He doesn't have to ask, wonder where they are. He just, I don't know how he did it, but he just knows. And so that should comfort, that should encourage us, and that should cause us to really understand uh, these three verses that we're going to read coming up here. And God is omnipotent, all-powerful. It's God who's formed us, not man. God is all-powerful, not us. Uh, we are his marvelous works. We didn't create ourselves. I mean, you ever, this is just me, okay? And we're almost done, so we're almost getting the verses. But I always wonder about the whole evolution program, right? I mean, I, you know. I don't know, I just, I walk by faith and not by sight, and you know, I just wonder about the whole Darwin thing. And I'm thinking that if, if this whole herd of amoebas, right, <laughs> rose up and marched forward in evolution, right, to become something different, then number one, why did they leave the rest of the herd back there? Why didn't the whole herd go there? And, and then number two, I mean, that just isn't, the way God says it works. And so, so in, in these verses, let me read what we're told, verses 13 through 18. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Now listen to what's said here in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought on the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written a day's fashion for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. This is a guy in sandals. This is a guy in a, in a, in a cloak. This is a guy grilling for food. This is, this is, wow, this is so far back in history. Yet, listen to the heart of David. He knows, he grabs, he understands, he lives, he breathes God. And that's in spite of the, the horrific things that David did. Lost a baby. Had a man killed, committed adultery. I mean, just so many things. Yet, faithful to receive and understand that his hand was against his creator. His hand moved against his almighty God. And he confessed and he repented. And God wrapped his arms about him and, and restored him. So as we've maybe talked a little bit about the omnis of God, I truly think we have to understand Scripture and, and the Old Testament in order for us to move to these last three verses. <clears throat> so a little bit of a recap in Romans uh, 8, before we get to Romans 8, 28. Uh, Romans 8, verses 18 through 22. The Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, assure us that all of creation groans. All of creation says... You want to be delivered from this death that we're in due to the sin in the garden in Romans 8, 23 through 25. Holy Scriptures assure us that all believers, all that are saved by faith through grace, we groan, waiting for our final redemption, right? Our, our glorified bodies to be uh, given to us. Our eternal transformation in Romans 8, verses 25 through 27. We're assured that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayer life. 
You ever get to that point where you don't know what to pray? I sat this morning, I sat down, um, it probably sounds like, like an owl, and I started praying, you know, and I'm like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, dude, that's just terrible. <laughs> like, God, I don't even want to, I don't know, I don't know what to say, God. I don't know how to approach you. I don't know what to do. I'm confessing, I'm repenting, I'm, I'm praising, I'm asking, but Lord, it's just such a mishmash. But the Spirit groans, the Holy Spirit groans and helps us in our weaknesses to pray. We pray that the will of God should be done. And as we open up um, our scriptures this morning, Romans 8, verses uh, 28 through 30, the scriptures assure us that this very first verse, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. All things work together for the good to those who love God. <laughs> it's hard to believe, huh? I don't want to show of hands. How many of you lost loved ones this week? I want to show. I want to show of hands. How many of you have lost loved ones going backwards? I don't want to show. <coughs> How many of you have lost, just lost hope? Not hope in the Lord, but hope in the moment. How many of you have done it? Yet God has seen you through all of it. He's seen us through all of it. He has been faithful to take those things that that. Satan thought to use to destroy us. He's used those things. What does it say here in verse 28 of uh, chapter 8 of Romans? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. God is working. God is molding. God is using. There's a lot of ingredients. My wife cooks a lot. I'm living testimony of that, right? My, she cooks a lot. And there are certain ingredients that she puts in um, to everything she makes. I have no doubt that if that was the only ingredient that I consumed, and I consumed it in large enough quantities, it, it would take and make me very ill. It would take and pretty much mess me up even more than I messed up already. <laughs> but in the right quantity, in the right measure, in the hand of an able, able uh, cook, if there's a better word for that, I don't know what it is, I'll have to ask my son-in-law to put that into the tape, whatever it is. Um, she takes and she puts these things together in such a way that even the stuff that I wouldn't eat by itself, I go, hey. it blends and it works and it makes the entirety of the dish pleasing and palatable. And so I'm going to read verses 28 through 30 uh, of our study this morning, and um, I'm going to break it down into uh, uh, to different uh, layers. Uh, verse 28, or Romans 8, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And this is this is that point where oh we're not doing this. <laughs> See, that's what happens. I'm sorry for the ears. We'll hand up your plugs next time. But that's what happens. He's not talking to those guys. He's talking to us guys. He's not talking to those that don't have the Holy Spirit within them. He's talking to us who have the Holy Spirit within. He is talking to those who are in Rome that are in the midst of, of just horrendous social things that are going on. And, and as Paul is the pen, God is the author, we as children are the recipients, these are all words of affirmation, encouragement, and, and love. Reading verse 28 the first part, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, I, I'm here to tell you that some of this that we're talking about today has to be uh, an experiential acknowledgement. 
as Christians, as those saved by the grace of God through faith, have you not experienced that all things work together for good, no matter how, at the moment, horrendous that they might seem? And perhaps you're not at this place where all of them have yet, but you're still here, God's still working, so that's, that's perhaps down the road. But, but all things work together <clears throat> for the good of God. When Noah was building the Arky Arky, that was a pretty intense moment, huh? You know, turn on the faucets and look what happens. You know, when, when Abram and Sarah were in the midst of uh, their issues with one another, and when Abram uh, was with Isaac for the sacrifice, there's some pretty intense moments. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel and the lion's den. I mean, you, you think of the many... The saints that have gone before us, Moses in the Red Sea, you're going to do what? Yeah, check it out. This is just going to go like that. And we're going to go through and they're going to... No, I mean, God has worked these things out. You know, New Testament times, just so many, so many that, that, that the Lord has worked in their lives. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist sent two folks to Jesus. Yeah, can you just go and talk to them? I'm in prison. They're, they're threatened to take my head away from me. Can you just, can you see, is he really the guy? Is he really the one? And I, it's a little bit of a cliff note paraphrase verse, version there. But, but the enormity of the trials and the tribulations that God allows upon our lives, allowed upon their lives, we can see historically, I mean historically, this is a historical book here, um, we, we can read that these things have worked together for the good of those who love God. Read now 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. We're told, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, all things work together for good. You know, at times, uh, I don't know if you've thought of this descriptive, you've resembled this descriptive, or you're going to say, never going to use that descriptive. Um, you feel like a moth sometimes. And have you ever, like, sat out on your patio and you've been assailed by insects or moths or whatever else, and, and you like those little tiki torch things, those little citronella candles? And, and what do the insects do, right? Go to the light, go to the light, go, you know, they just go in there and you're, they're gone, they're gone. And, and the picture that, that I like to get of me is like in the midst of danger and toil, if, if I were like that insect and somebody would get me and shake me off and say, don't go towards the light, I go towards the light because the light is the Lord and it doesn't matter what happens because the Lord's got me covered. So reading out of 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 7, we're told, In this you greatly rejoice, that now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So back to this uh, scripture, we know all things work together uh, for good to those who love God, that you've been grieved by various trials. Listen to this, listen to what scripture says, that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's pretty awesome, huh? It's pretty comforting. Huh? <clears throat> so as the Lord continues through the pen of Paul to uh, bring these things forward, we're going to stop there this morning. Uh, we're going to go forward um, next week. Hopefully get done next week. We'll see. But uh, as the worship team comes up, um, continue to pray for... Uh, all that's going on in Neil's life, uh, Neil's sick, and um, 
he is getting better, but he wasn't good enough to uh, show up this morning. Pray for Dan. Dan Sickler got moved to a facility on the Hemet San Jacinto border, so he's close. Um, for those of you on the prayer uh, team, you've gotten the updates, but um, Dan is now able to sit up in bed, swing his legs over, and actually touch the ground. He no longer has to use oxygen to breathe, and so that's pretty awesome. So you can pray for, for Dan. And I just want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank you guys for uh, joining in worship this morning. And uh, it, uh, it's pretty incredible that uh, the Lord would raise up those who are unafraid to get up here and, uh, and just, uh, well, Mark's afraid. Okay. It's amazing God would, would raise up mostly unafraid folks to be up here and sing worship. But, you know, we, we miss Neil, but we have voices that can sing and, and praise our Lord. We have lives that we can give to him. We, we need to really understand the uh, preciousness of God's love for us. And as we continue next week um, in these three verses, we really need to come to an understanding that we're here for one reason, one reason alone. To live our lives in the way to magnify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to be doing a memorial in a couple of weeks. And... Uh, and that the thing I always try and focus on is um, to comfort those who know the Lord and to give out useful information, useful information to those who don't know the Lord. And then I just have to stand back and trust God. And that's where we all should be. Um, you know, just bring forward the gospel, be good table waiters, and let God deal with uh, what happens. Amen.